Jim, when you told me yesterday that you've been here for three months, uh, it, it, you know, I don't even know how you got what you've done here in three months done. I mean, it is really, we, when, when I walked in yesterday, it, it, it almost takes your breath away. And, you know, we've, of course, we've been to the main museum in Fairfax, and the, the, we all know how beautiful and, and, and great that is. But you come here to Springfield, Missouri, the national headquarters of the Bass Pro Shops, and you see this museum. Um, and to be one of the first, I'm going to call civilians, because, you know, you've been here and the, the, work, uh, the yeah. workers have been here, but to be one of the first civilians to actually be here, um, it was pretty special. And, and, you know, sometimes it was really quiet and there was no one else here. Talk about the process of this museum. What got it started? Why is it here? And how did we get to today? Well, this has literally been years in the making. Uh, this stems out of a great relationship between Bass Pro and NRA and certainly a, a personal relationship between Wayne LaPierre and uh, Johnny Morris with Bass Pro and, and uh, Richard Childress uh, involved in that. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, the construction of this museum has been, the physical construction has taken two years. Yeah. So uh, a remarkable creative team was working on this before we got here to fill the cases, to tell the story, to provide the guns. And then once we got here, there's a great creative team uh, from both Bass Pro and NRA working together on this. When we open our doors tomorrow, I think this will set an entirely new standard yeah. in terms of design and layout of firearms museums. I don't think there's anything else that compares to this. And certainly in terms of the guns and the collections yeah. and the art that will be on display here, this will be one of the premier uh, firearms-related institutions in the world. You know, and it's funny, I was looking at one of, um, you get to town, they give you the tourist magazines, and it said that uh, this Bass Pro Shops that we're standing in now is the biggest tourist attraction in the state of Missouri. Now think about that. The St. Louis Arch is in, you know, in St. Louis. You always think of that as the iconic uh, symbol of Missouri and, and of, of the Midwest. You know, but they, this is the number one tourist attraction. Yeah, they say they get four million people through the doors here each year, which is double uh, number two attraction in Missouri. They say it's the number one attraction in the Midwest mm -hmm. in a, a multiple state region. And it is the uh, it's uh, the number one store. It's the mothership. Mm -hmm. It's the the first one. It's where Johnny Moore started out. It, it, and Jim, you said yesterday you called it that. And the mothership, I think, is the best way to describe <laughs> it. And, and by the way, I don't know if you guys can see this on camera. Here's in the paper today a big banner ad in the back about what's going on here. This this is a huge launch. At, at, at what's a, just a huge place here. You're, you're driving physically. When we drove in yesterday, Cameron, I think it's two to three like city blocks. The actual physical everything set up here. Take there's two to three buildings. There's a, there's a like a conservancy building, a teaching building. There's an outlet store. There's the big main store. There's where we. I are. just found out there's a range in the store. A, yeah, <laughs> an appropriate. And and where we are now, you can th this museum, which is beautiful, overlooks the part of the store, it's just amazing. So you've got uh, over here, and I don't know if guys can pan over and, and get a little bit of that, there, there's the, the, the actual display cases overlook the store, <laughs> right. which is just an amazing concept. And, you, and, and tell us a little bit, Jim, about sort of paint with word pictures for those who are listening on, on satellite radio as well. As you walk in the main hall, it's just breathtaking. The entrance to this museum is spectacular. They have literally built the stairway leading up to this museum out of hundreds of percussion muzzle-loading muskets for the railing. The, uh, the attention to detail is remarkable. The uh, uh, NRA logo in brass is inlaid into the front of each stair and the, and the sides. sides. Yeah, yeah. Uh, They've put shotgun-style checkering on the handrails. They put color case hardening on the metal trim on the beautiful wood floors they've installed. We actually we see it all, all throughout here too yeah. as well. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. The yeah. attention to detail is fantastic. And then the layout is neat. You come in and there's the main entrance hall as you mentioned. Then you come back here, it, it opens up to the level we're in. Then there's another level and a grand staircase up there. And, and I hear, Jim, there's a pretty good story. Of there's a bear at the top of the stairs. It took a lot of work to get that bear to the top of the stairs, I understand. Some of the things they've done here to get stuff in, <laughs> get stuff out. We've got guys carrying leopards upstairs over their shoulders. We've got guys carrying elephant tusks, tusks like they're porters on a safari throughout here. The, uh, the Bass Pro warehouses where they have this great taxidermy, these great uh, sporting 
related paraphernalia. It's it, kind of like the scene from the in, end of Indiana Jones. It's uh, it's this great warehouse with all this stuff in it that they've accumulated over the decades because they've got, you know, what, 90 different stores all over the country. And this one is only getting bigger. They're, they're building on. They're going to about double the square footage here. There will be a number of museums here when they get done. Uh, wow. I hear anywhere from, from 7 to 12 different museums and, in wow. addition to this one. And I understand the folks here at Bass Pro have just been so helpful and instrumental in making this happen. It's like a labor of love between you guys at, at, at the National Farms Museum, the NRA, and the folks here at Bass Pro. Well, the talent level here is remarkable. They've brought in an exceptional artist to do murals within the cases. So there's great artwork on the back walls of the cases. Then in front of that, we have original oil paintings on loan from the Remington Arms Company, these great, iconic sporting and hunting images that everybody's familiar with. Is, that, exactly, is that one of them right over these there? These are two of them right here. Yeah, now, right now, over, guys. right now, these are reproductions. The mm -hmm. originals are undergoing conservation. They will be here this fall, but the originals of all these famous oil paintings will be on display here. Right now, we have... Uh, a number of brand new collections that have never been seen before on display here. Certainly uh, uh, preeminent among those is the Remington Factory Collection. We've got a hundred guns, a couple dozen paintings that have never been seen outside of the factory in uh, uh, Remington at, at Ilion, New York. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a prototype guns, models that Remington was developing in the late 1800s, never been seen before, never actually produced but key stepping stones to some of the great sporting arms they've produced. You've got serial number one. You've got the first Remington Model 870 oh, here. You've got the 10 millionth Remington 870 <laughs> ever made here. Beautifully engraved gun, but just a spectacular Remington collection. You know, you look around um, and some of the, I, uh, tell me about the, there was a gun that was attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte. You have a, uh, you have some uh, guns from Annie Oakley. Tell, talk about some of the more uh, the historical guns connected to some really historical figures in, in, in the world. Yeah, you know, you think about this museum. We've got guns from three presidents here. Mm -hmm. We've got guns from five Congressional Medal of Honor recipients. We've got uh, Old West outlaws and lawmen. Right, right here, I see an Olympic medal, too. <laughs> an Olympic medal, yeah, gold medal. Mm -hmm. and, and the gun that was used to win it, uh, Colonel uh, McMillan's gold medal and his... Uh, pistol from the Rome 1960 Olympics. You've got the Annie Oakley guns, a lot of great champion guns here, championship shooters. So uh, uh, the history here is remarkable. We've got uh, uh, the Napoleon Fowler is a centerpiece. Talk certainly. about it. Yeah, yeah. It's an exquisite double barrel flintlock. It has not only gold inlay, but also silver and platinum. It has a purple velvet cheek piece. This belonged to Napoleon. He gave it to one of his generals. Uh, it's just an exquisite, exquisite gun. You know, when you look around, uh, you see a lot of these, you know, of course, there's a little plate describing the gun, and you also see donated by X. How do you get these people to give up these guns? I would never <laughs> in my life. Jim, I love yeah. you like a brother. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. give you no, anything. Wait, wait, yeah. If Hold I had Napoleon's gun, yeah. I wouldn't give it to anybody. <laughs> Can I point a point of, of, of privilege here? I was with Jim doing and Phil out at the NRA annual meeting and, and conventions this year, watching him getting that done and recruiting. Yeah. Uh, it, you had you did a lot of work to get these firearms in here. Well, they, these have been donated. Guns have been no, donated to the NRA for 80 years. Sure. And there's people who have the insight and the foresight to understand that this message of, of the importance of firearms to our country, to our culture, uh, has to be communicated to future generations. So it's very generous individuals. Uh, who have who see that coming understand that we have to communicate this story. We have brought in some exceptional collections here, both donated and on loan, uh, uh, that uh, uh, really get the story across. We're very grateful to the people who donated and the exceptional loans that we have of collections here. You, so, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to let everyone know if you're just tuning into Cam and Company, it's John Pop and Cameron Gray filling in for Cam. Two lucky guys here. It's the grand opening, the NRA National Sporting Arms Museum here at, as Jim Sapika put it, the Bass Pro Mothership here in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, 
amazing. You say the grand opening is tomorrow. Tomorrow is the grand. Yeah, we're here for the grand opening. Today's our preview show, just like we've done preview shows at Shot Show and, and our annual meeting. We're out here today and tomorrow because there's just so much to do. Uh, and just to give folks an idea of, of, of all that's coming up, uh, Cameron, you've been doing a phenomenal job. Give them a little teaser of some of the things we have coming up in the next couple of days. Well, we <laughs> have. Um, there's, uh, I have a, we have a very special guest who's a, 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 a let's say an entertainer and you know we're close to Branson, Missouri, Jim. Yeah. By the way, have you been down to Branson? I love Branson. <laughs> I love Branson. Can we talk about Branson for a second? Sure. Sure. I got to tell you, you know, I I have a bucket list and I've been very fortunate in my career to go to a lot of different places, but for the longest time now I've wanted to go to Branson, Missouri. Yeah. And everyone I know, ah, Branson, you want to go to Branson? It's old people, and blue hairs, and stupid shows. Blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you, Jim. You know, you get there, and it is like it's almost the best of America. When, especially for us who work, you know, yeah. for and with the NRA, <laughs> at the souvenir shops they sell NRA T-shirts yeah. in Branson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a sign when you walk in, and it says, you know, for God and country and gun-toting Americans. And it's there's a there's a theater, God and Country Theater. Yeah, uh, I went to see uh, this uh, artist Shoji Tabuchi. I, I, I don't know yeah, if, you, if people know him. He's a uh, he's a Japanese fiddle player who can play any kind of style of music. And his whole message is about America, and I, I love this country, and, uh, you know, the, the patriotism on display in Branson is amazing. Um, you know, talk about your experiences there, and talk about it as a, as a, you know, people, it's the butt of too many jokes, but it's a really great, fun town, and it's great for any red-blooded American out there. Las Vegas for Baptists, right? <laughs> It really is it Vegas is. without it the is. casinos. Yeah. I, 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 down I love I love Branson, yeah. and I have. I mean, I, I, I'm a homeboy here. I'm yeah, three yeah. hours from right. where I lived until I five years ago I moved out to run the museum in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. But whenever the kids would have a three-day weekend, we'd come down here. We'd hit the Bass Pro Store right. because it is a destination. <laughs> right. But then we'd go down to Branson, right. see a show. The level of entertainment is spectacular. Yeah, the like hospitality. 50, 50 theaters. It is. Uh, hospitality industry is there. Yeah. There is great, uh, wonderful, wonderful shows. I'm, I, I'm more confident that I'll go into a show at Branson and enjoy it than I am in Vegas. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, I, love, uh, I, I love it. Uh, people don't realize what an uh, incredible entertainment hub it is. And right here next to, uh, next to this incredible store. Yeah. And, 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 and saying that you, you being from originally from this area, I think it's so cool that this museum is here at this place in, in this part of the country because we spend a lot of time, you and I and the other folks out at the Farns Museum in in Fairfax. Yeah. I've been to the other satellite museums, but there's something about being here because people, they, 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 they talk the talk and they walk the walk this here. This is huge to us. Yes. The, you know, the four million people a year through the doors here. These are our people. Yes. These are people who are like us. They're NRA people. They're gun people. They appreciate hunting, outdoors, firearms. They understand the Second Amendment in their gut. Right. And uh, uh, to have this facility here available to the, the folks that come through the door, uh, it's remarkable. And that's a very, very important thing about this is the people who will be able to take advantage of this right. will be able to see it. We'll be able to pass this on to the next generation. We've had some kids walking through this on preview, and uh, they love it. And they're there looking at the signs, they're reading them, they're understanding the history, and uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. Yeah, and, and it really, you guys have done a spectacular job, especially here in some of the other satellite projects, of not making people, that, it's nice when they can come to Fairfax, but reaching out to them. And when you do a museum like this, Jim, it's reaching out. Of course, there's virtual. You, you've got all social media and, and a great website. But it's you. You can't substitute being here and seeing these firearms to be able to stand right there and look at them. The, and 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 the, you're doing everything you guys can to reach out to people all yeah, over the country yeah. to make them available to. Well, them. we do the outreach through the website, through television shows, through the books we're we're putting out. Right. But there is nothing like seeing oh, yeah. the thing. You see that piece of history. You say this was Theodore Roosevelt's nightstand pistol at the White House. Right. You see Frank Hamer's revolver, the guy who brought Bonnie and Clyde's career to an end. You see some of these spectacular guns, and and it's uh, it's an entirely different thing. You know, the trend in museums so much is going to video displays and graphics and games for the kids to play. And those are all great. They're educational. But our emphasis has always been to show the artifact, to show the actual mm. piece of history. Two weeks ago, we had something come in I didn't know was coming in. And 
It was Alexander Hamilton's powder horn. Oh. And for me, that's a Goosebumps artifact. Yeah. We opened that up and to actually have that in my hand, even oh. if I had my gloves With on. With the white gloves, <laughs> still in your hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, to have that tangible piece of history wow. here where it, we can show it to people, we can share it with people, we can tell the backstory of what that involves and who that was and what that means, that's something you can't, you can't get off of television. You can't get it out of a book. Uh, it's, it's the real deal. And you're speaking, uh, you're hearing Jim Sapika, director of the National Farms Museum. I'm John Pop. Museum. I was going to say, we need to change your tag. It says National Farm. <laughs> By the way, Cameron, I was having such trouble getting the name right. They actually gave me a shirt to wear so I can <laughs> read the name. It. The NRA Just National don't read it backwards. Sporting <laughs> Arms Museum. <laughs> That's I know, I it. Upside down. So uh, before we let you go, Jim, give people, just to give a, a scale, where, um, what I'm trying to do when we pulled in here, when Cameron and I drove in, to the parking lot, I said, how do we do this as responsible, you know, broadcasters and what we are to give people an idea of the scope of not only this museum, and we're only here for two days, we do the best we can, as we do to any, any remote we do for NRA News, the scope, not only of the, and the beauty of the museum and the size and scope of, of this whole place, it's amazing. It's I, I, walking through. I, I likened it to Cameron to being at Shot Show. When you walk through the halls, oh, absolutely. The Shot Show is the big industry show, right. and it's almost overwhelming going through the halls. I went downstairs here and walked out to go. There's a there's a restaurant in here, and there's ponds, and there's animals, and there's then they sell stuff too. But well, to no, walk not only is there a restaurant, but there's a restaurant on the billboard said it's Springfield's best brunch. Best brunch is right here at Bass Pro. <laughs> it is. And, it and is. So to give an idea of scale, I'm walking through and I'm like feeling like I'm at Shot Show. I'm a little overwhelmed, quite frankly, going. Wow, but explain to people the process, how long, you've had pretty much your entire staff in here, how long have you been here, and, and what did it take to get this together, like the, the time frame you guys put into this place? Well, we actually have a fairly small staff uh, at the museum. It's, it's seven full-time individuals, and uh, uh, basically we packed up and went out here and left uh, two ladies there to run the museum during our busiest season. The summer is all our busy, busy, always busiest season. So, so God bless Sylvia and Caroline because they were doing the work of seven people back there while we were out here playing with all these really cool yeah. guns. But uh, Doug Wickland, Phil Schreier, Matt Sharp were all out here helping us. Uh, and again, the the incredible staff uh, associated with uh, with Bass Pro here has just done an exceptional oh, yeah. exceptional job. They so. guys, they're so great. They've been so great with us. And 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 literally, NRA annual meetings was back in May, correct? Yes. yes. Literally, I think you were on the ground before. Well, you've been on the ground for years yeah. getting this, but you were like literally. You've been here since before that, just here. Last, I, last time I was home in Virginia was in April, so I came yeah. out here in we, April, did the annual meeting. So it's not home anymore. Really. Yes. Well, yeah. he's yeah. Kind, he's kind of almost home <laughs> this here. Is right? home. Yeah. yeah, this yeah. is home. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And so you've been here. I know Phil's been in and out of here. Doug's still here. Matt, of course, he always. Where is he sleeping in the back? Is he working, Matt? <laughs> we keep him in the box in the back. Excellent. Yeah. He's here working. Yeah. And so just the amount of labor and man hours to get this together. And, and but but geez, it all works out so beautiful. Yeah. And, and let me give everyone a little teaser on the shows. Besides the shows here for Cam and Company Classic, I like to call it Cameron Gray. Uh, we're, we're also recording. I finally got here to, out here to do it. As soon as we finish at five Eastern time today, you and I are going to sit down and we're going to do curators' corners. I'm looking forward uh, to that. Today and tomorrow, and we're bringing those back. So we're going to bring you the next installments, and that's on Cam and Company on Sportsman Channel. Entering news, Cam and Company on Sportsman every Monday. We're going to be doing the next, starting this Monday coming up, the, the next two install, or the next number of installments will be, as many as we can get done, will be from right here on this set and in this museum. So. Now, you know, you talk about this, the uh, Sportsman Channel and the, the uh, segment you guys do in there. Um, you guys, you and Phil have your own show in the Sportsman Channel. Yeah. And uh, what, what will this museum, you know, what role will this museum take uh, on the show? Will, will you, how you feature this Well, we on certainly your TV hope show? it will get involved. I mean, what we've been working now is to get the guns hung on the wall right. and, and the doors open. Yeah. But uh, the potential for this facility is incredible in terms of that great guns and gold show oh, yeah. that we've been doing on Sportsman channel this would be a great venue for that mm -hmm. uh any number we we have a number of shows filming in the museum periodically and certainly this is a spectacular setting for it there's some great uh, background images here certainly some wonderful firearms so we hope to be filming a number of television shows in here you know i wanted to ask you phil you know you talk about the annie oakley guns and the presidential guns and give us one of the stories of one of the guns here from a person we've never heard of before. Well, give us a, a well, really you may have heard story. of them, but let me tell you, you know, th those guns are important. 
But no, one no, thing, of course, but I, but you know, I like one the lesser known get, stories. Yeah, one thing we get, and this is especially important in that timeline of sporting arms that goes throughout the history, but I like every bit as much when someone goes up and says, you know, Dad has a gun like that, or, you mm -hmm. know, that's the, that's the type of shotgun uh, Granddad used when he first took me hunting. We've got in the very first exhibit case in the museum this old Browning A5 shotgun, the old humpback autoloader, Belgian Browning classic shotgun. It has a huge wad of white adhesive tape wrapped around the muzzle. It looks like a golf ball on the <laughs> muzzle. And I, this, it's one of my favorite guns in the museum. It, uh, it belonged to Johnny Morris's dad. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, when, when I first met uh, uh, Mr. Morris for the first time, I was in his office. He showed me this very well-used A5. But uh, uh, to me, I, I wanted that gun for this museum, and uh, he was gracious enough to loan it to us because it really tells that multi-generational story. It tells the story of firearms actually used in the field, uh, tells the, the family relationship, and to me, that's, uh, that's one of the really great guns in this museum. The other thing, too, you know, you walk around and you say, oh, there's the, the gun my dad hunted with. I would imagine that you've seen more than once uh, a member uh, of, uh, who served in the armed forces who pointed out a, a service rifle that they used or a service pistol that they used. Um, are there any emotional moments like that when, when people see that the guns that they actually used, you know, in the theater, in battle, um, you know, and have you seen any of that? And what, you know, what does there's, that do to your heart? There certainly are. Um, if you got a minute, I'll tell you a great story about a shotgun here. It. Uh, this is Phil's story, so I'm, I'm stealing it from him. All the great stories are Phil's stories. <laughs> but this was a gun. It's Dwight David Eisenhower's Model 21 shotgun. Ooh. And it was on display in Fairfax. We brought it here. But Phil said, when we first had it at display there, he came in, and there was a guy standing there. It looked like he was from Central Casting for Secret Service. He was standing there. He was staring at that gun. He'd look left. He'd look right. He'd look back at the gun. Stood there for 10 minutes. Finally, Phil came up and said, uh, sir, is there anything I can tell you about that gun? And the guy said, no, but I can tell you something about that. Whoa. He said, I had that gun in my hands my first and last day on the job. Oh. The guy had been on the presidential detail of the Secret Service. Wow. His very first day on the job, he was assigned to Eisenhower. <laughs> and Ike wanted to go hunting. <laughs> So they went into gun, to Ike's gun room. The, the boss said, okay, everybody grab a shotgun. Everybody left this beautiful Model 21 with five stars on the bottom for five-star general. <laughs> left it sitting there, so the kid went over and said, that's a good-looking shotgun. Yeah. And he reached for it, and his boss said, that's Ike's gun. Don't yeah. touch it. First day on the job, huh, kid? Yeah, yeah. Don't Eisen mess up. Eisenhower said, ah, oh, the kid's got a good eye for a gun. Let him take it. Wow. So he took it hunting with Dwight Eisenhower <laughs> his first day. His last day on the job, the day he was retiring, he was assigned to Mamie Eisenhower. And she said, go up and get Ike's gun. So he went up and got the shotgun. She had him drive her down to NRA headquarters in Washington, D.C. and carry that gun in to present it to the NRA. Wow. And we're proud to, <laughs> proud to be able to bring it here. Wow. Well, okay, and, and you made me think of something here. I keep saying before I let you go, but... but yeah, this is too much, Jim. Yeah, sorry, sorry Jim. <laughs> can't let you go. We'll get to a break in a few minutes. But, okay, tell folks a little bit about that. I was going to have talk about a little bit about Bass Pro, but tell them about the lineage of, because I always appreciate that, of the NRA and its, its, its sort of commitment and in, in the, in the growth of the whole Firearms Museum. You guys, originally, NRA was in Washington, D.C. with yeah. the museum there. Yeah. Then kind of tell us how uh, Fairfax and the other stuff that... That has happened. Well, this is an 80-year-old museum, and basically it grew out of the publications division of the NRA. People were getting these great guns in, and, and uh, uh, they were keeping them, and eventually established it as the NRA museum. Matter of fact, here in this museum, we have brought the very first gun from the NRA yeah. collection. Every which, time I walk uh, by, I stop. It's so yeah, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1876, uh, it was an award gun for a shooting match. It was presented to the winner, who was at time the secretary of the NRA, eventually the president of the NRA. But that's in a display case up there. But that's our roots. And we had this museum in uh, when we are in downtown Washington, D.C. We had a very nice museum. A very simple museum. It was basically hooks on pegboard behind <laughs> glass. But we were very proud of it. Right. Uh, before I was employed by NRA, but I was a member, I got to visit this a couple times, and that was a huge thing for me to get to visit that. 
But we built this beautiful new building, what, 15 years ago? Took us a couple years to mm -hmm. be able to scrounge up the funding from the generosity of members uh, uh, all over the country to be able to actually build the museum, but built that beautiful museum in Fairfax, which was a huge thing. It's a great museum. Attendance there has doubled over the past five years. So more and more people are coming to it. Two or three years ago, we had this huge event where Robert E. Peterson's estate donated his gun collection, best gun yeah. collection in the country as far as I know. They brought it in. They said, you take your pick of whatever guns you want, but display what you take. Don't hide them in the basement. Have them out where people can see them, and we'll fund the construction of a new gallery yeah. to Amazing. exhibit. Largest gift in the history of the NRA. Wow. But we built that gallery the single finest room of guns anywhere in the world. I, I firmly believe that. So it's an it's an exceptional it's gallery. L largest collection of just even Gatling guns. Gatling right? guns. We have yeah. ten Gatling guns in ten, the museum. There. And little Gatling guns, Cameron, and really big <laughs> Gatling guns too. Yeah. There's, there's a gun one, over here that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one that went uh, went to San Juan Hill with Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. So incredible wow. history there. Uh, uh, and that's what it is. It's a repository of history, and, and like we've said so many times, communicating the story of firearms, their importance to America, their importance to freedom, communicating, that, communicating to that to this and future generations. All right, so this will be the last question, Jim, because I know you're a busy man. You've got a lot to do before the grand opening tomorrow. You talk about uh, what this does for the present, the future generations. When you walk in here, you see NRA signage. Um, you know, this is, this is a good effort also by the NRA to attract new members. You know, there will be a lot of people who are coming to the Bass Pro will come up here and see NRA Museum, and they'll become NRA members. Um, you know, what is the goal in terms of that? And does, does, have you noticed also when you, when you show guns like this in a historical manner, and they're not the, you know, the awful things that are portrayed in the mainstream media, and people see the history and the beauty and the elegance of them, um, do you garner new NRA members? And, and, and do you really do you get a sense of satisfaction when you sign people up who come just because they saw the museum? Oh, absolutely. And you know, there are a lot of people out there who, who sympathize with the NRA, a lot of people out there who are former members that just kind of let it lapse and they come to a place like this. We have a kiosk at the front where they can join electronically, they can sign up online, they can go to the website to sign up. But yes, uh, uh, you know, the I am the NRA bumper stickers, that's very true. The NRA is the membership. Mm -hmm. They're the people who make this possible. Uh, they're the people who make all the functions of the NRA, the training, the safety, uh, all, the, all the effort that goes into NRA. It's entirely the members. It's nothing else. And, uh, yes, we expect a very positive turnout from the folks who show up here, members renewing, uh, brand-new members who see this and want to be part of it, and uh, uh, folks who were a member a few years ago, let it lapse, and uh, need that little reminder to get back on the membership rolls. Yeah, it's great for a member now to come see, you know, what their money goes to. Exactly. You know, things like this, I mean, they, they should see it with their own eyes. Yeah.